Hello and welcome to News Click today in Talking Science and Tech. We will be looking at the issue of the lab leak theory, the theory that the virus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, actually leaked from a lab in China. And we see again that this uh, issue, this theory is being pushed in the mainstream media as being uh, equally possible that as, as the theory that the virus naturally evolved. So we have with us Prabir Kurkayasa to discuss the plausibility of these two scenarios and how possible are the two scenarios? Are the two scenarios equally possible or really how do you weigh them? So Prabir, can you tell us about this? This sort this this is narrative that is being pushed. Yeah, I don't I want to widen this framing of the issue that how do you actually evaluate different possibilities? When, for instance, you have a lab leak versus nature issue, where you have also, for instance, the UFO issue. Now, that's an interesting one because there is a re recent US uh, military report about detailed examination they have done UFOs visit uh, the world or not. And that has come out with a number of instances where they have no explanation, therefore appearing to say that UFOs could actually have come. Now, I take this also with the, uh, the US administration demand of Saddam Hussein that he showed us that he has no WMDs, but I'll postpone that for the time being. Let's look at alternative hypothesis when it is framed and how do we normally evaluate it? You see, if you ask people that, you know, there are two possibilities, immediately the brain receives it as if there are two equally probable hypothesis. So it doesn't appear that the possibilities could have completely different probabilities. And I think that's the key issue here. When you frame it that there are two hypotheses about the, how the uh, current coronavirus COVID-19 epidemic emerged, the understanding is if there are two hypotheses, then both should have equal probability to start. Now, the difference here is that we have had very small outbreaks from labs earlier of viruses which have been studied and they have infected very few people. So five, six, 10, those are the kind of numbers we have seen. And these leaks have also been very few. Leaks meaning either because somebody got infected because of the biosafety uh, precautions not being taken and infected a few others. So this is one class of thing against epidemics, which have repeatedly occurred in nature. We have hundreds of epidemics which have occurred. And in this century, of course, we have the SARS, MERS, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the viruses that have uh, all coronavirus. But we have also had the H5N1, H1N1 repeatedly being threatened. And some of them have actually occurred as epidemics. We have every year new flu viruses that emerge. And we have number of millions of cases that takes place the world over. So we periodically see viruses emerge from nature. And why is it that the pathways of such emergence are enormous? Why? Because animals are much larger in number, as you know, than, for instance, laboratories, particularly biosafety laboratories where such research is conducted. So numbers of animals which carry different zoonotic diseases, as we call them, are enormous. They are very large. In China, they've, for instance, investigated 80,000 animals. But the point is, there's still a small drop in the ocean compared to the total number of animals that exist. They can directly infect millions of people they're in contact with, birds, bats, rats, all of these called are carriers of zoonotic diseases. And of course, we know from the uh, uh, Ebola case, we don't know what the carrier is, but we know, for instance, in the AIDS epidemic, that the carrier was a chimpanzee. So you have this N number of vectors which are there, and they can directly infect human beings, but they can also have intermediate animals, which become then the route to the human being. So you really see that as what happened in the for instance, SARS or SARS-CoV-1, as we now call it, or MERS, where in one case, it was actually 
the civet, which seems to have been the carrier, intermediate animal, and the other was uh, the camels, which actually acted as intermediate cat intermediate carrier between the bats and the human population. So the number of pathways are enormous. The populations are very large. Therefore, though we put it as if it's an either or hypothesis, it's actually the probability of one is much larger because the possibilities within that are literally myriads against the few, very few uh, web, you know, biological research laboratories that exist in the world which can carry out such research. Now, there have been also questions why is the why Wuhan Research Laboratory uh, was doing, uh, working on this virus, and it is close to Wuhan where obviously uh, the first known cases are broken out. But that's where you normally put a research laboratory because this kind of diseases are there. The Ebola laboratory is there where Ebola is prevalent. So all of these are naturally what happens so if you have any endemic disease that exists, then of course the research laboratory is going to be close to there. And that's why Wuhan Research Laboratory is where it is, because it's researching bad viruses. Now, so that's, that's one part of it. I want to draw the parallel to the UFO example for exactly the same reason, that we believe it's either extraterrestrial or it is nature so human in, in the world terrestrial phenomena. If you frame it like this, you are again causing a binary that extraterrestrial or terrestrial, except the terrestrial phenomena within it has a huge number of alternative possibilities. People making simple mistakes, mistaking natural phenomena for extraterrestrial uh, interventions, or even man-made phenomena of different kinds, balloons and so on, being identified as UFOs. So what you, by this binary, framing it in this particular way, you are actually comparing millions of possibilities against one very specific or maybe five, 10 very specific things that you know, are quote unquote as the alternatives. And therefore the probabilities of that are very, very different. And I think this is the problem. Putting it as the alternative as possibilities that then the argument is, why should we not look at the lab as, as an equally possible uh, hypothesis? And equally, the word is not used, but that's the way it is actually framed. And saying, we should then look at this as well. And then, of course, you have the next is the conspiracy hypothesis of different kinds, where you put all kinds of correlations and claim that this is why it must have happened in the way they presume the lab leak occurred. But I would like, as I said, to go back to the UFO case. What does the UFO case show? There are literally number of such instances where they could not identify the possible cause. So therefore, they have said, we can't prove it is not extraterrestrial. And I think this is the problem that we now have. It has been basically also come in public domain through all the newspapers, UFOs could actually exist. The American uh, investigation show that yes, there are possibilities of UFO. So I think this is the whole problem that because you could not identify it for what it was from this grainy old camera photos, which were there at that point of time to extrapolate that we can't understand it and therefore it must be extraterrestrial still is equivalent to saying that because we haven't found an animal which infected us, <clears throat> Therefore, it could be, it's a lab. I think both are the equal, equal possibility arguments that are being presented as equal probability arguments. I think this is where the fundamental problem in science lies, that we cannot disprove something that easy, that to disprove something is almost an impossibility. And because there are so many ways that it could happen. And we, as human beings, have not explored all the possibilities at any point of time. That's why we get the problem of trying to find something which does not exist and proving that it does not exist. So, right, Prabir, talk about disproving, and we also can look at the example of uh, WMDs in Iraq and Saddam Hussein being asked to prove that he does not have those weapons or 
the Wuhan lab being asked to prove that they, in fact, that the, that the virus did not leak from there. So then in such scenarios also, then how do they go about proving this, you know, that, that this negative, uh, the, the, basically it's a negative that this did not happen. Yeah, proving the negative is impossible, essentially. Logically, to show something did not happen is, is, is it's almost an impossible task, unless, you know, there is, your, there is a murder which has taken place at a particular point of time, and you have an alibi. Now, unfortunately, those are not the examples we are talking about. Saddam Hussein's case is very interesting because if, the, if you looked at the American television coverage at that point, or all the media articles that were coming, the argument was a very simple one, that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. To show his good faith, all he has to show is to disclose and destroy it. If he does not, if he doesn't disclose them, it's proof that he has weapons of mass destruction, which is not disclosed. So it started by saying that weapons of mass destruction exist in Iraq, Saddam has it, so the only way he can show that he doesn't have it is to give it to us, show it to us, and then we will destroy it. But the point is, even if he did that, assuming, for example, he had a few tucked away, the point is that how does he prove he doesn't have more? So this is where the issue really lay over there, that they had allowed weapons inspector to go anywhere and everywhere. The military intelligence agencies, which were there, part of those inspections that had mapped out uh, Iraq's everything very thoroughly. And therefore, it was very useful to the Iraq invasion later and the bombings. But Saddam trying to prove a negative was never wrong. And we remember the two proof that the United States presented. One was the Yolo cakes, which was the case which was from Niger, which was disproved by actually their own internal uh, US staff who said this is bogus. And that we had created a lot of problems later on for one of the persons who was a partner of a CIA agent who was actually exposed by the Bush administration, trying to darken his name and the claim that the, where, where this yellow cakes from Niger were really not uh, being imported by Saddam Hussein. And we have the famous example of uh, U.S. Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell presenting as a biological weapon something which was essentially a moving uh, mobile van for purposes of purely collecting samples and so on. So providing these kind of evidence was what led to the Iraq war. And we now know that you, the, Saddam Hussein did not have WMDs, either biological weapons, as Colin Powell had stated in the UN Security Council, or uh, what the Bush administration was create, claiming right through about nuclear weapons. And this is what was the UK uh, also completely backed with supposedly their input. So proving the negative wasn't possible. And as we said, even giving all access did not help Saddam Hussein. Now, what in this particular case, Xi Zhengli, the Chinese expert on coronaviruses, particularly bat coronaviruses, would really roamed in all places where bats are there, trying to study possible infections that they may carry to humans, zoonotic diseases, who's really played a stellar role, including in Ebola, uh, trying to find vaccines for Ebola and so on. So, this she has said in one interview, uh, I think with New York Times, she says, I'm being asked to prove the, that something did not happen. How do I prove something did not happen? How do I prove a negative? So this was her position as well. That's how do I prove that something did not happen when it didn't happen? And we have Gillian Addison, who was the last researcher in the Wuhan laboratory, foreign researcher who was there at this particular time, or at least in contact with people at this particular time. She was there just before, I think, the actually pandemic broke out. And she says that in this whole period, she was very familiar with the work being done in the lab, the kind of protocols it's followed, that an accidental break, lab break of a virus was almost impossible. And she doesn't, she said there is no evidence 
that there were people who were infected and it leaked out. So this, uh, this was a lab which had BSL-4 standards, which are very high standards. And she herself says that the kind of standards that were followed were actually better than in most other similar uh, laboratories. And she instituted some of those practices in the Singapore laboratory that she works in. She is an Australian origin uh, scientist who also works in Singapore. So we have other evidence that we that are there that this is not something which would have happened apart from numerous scientists saying that, look, looking at the possibilities that this seems to be a very weak hypothesis, if at all possible. And this is what the WHO report actually says. Of course, given the politicization of the issue, this has led to a huge demand that uh, this should be treated on par with this. There is Nicholas Wade who wrote a very racist theory of uh, population genetics, claiming that why white races are superior and essentially. And this is something which he did exactly the way he has done here, that he took all evidences from whatever sources he could find, filtered out only little bits and pieces, strung it together to say that this is the hypothesis science backs. And it's only political correctness that people are scientists are not saying this. He has done the essential hatchet job here. Before that, it wasn't something which was in popular domain very strongly. But Nicholas Wade, having originally been a correspondent in the science correspondent of Times, New York Times, and he had some credibility before this book that he published about 10 years back, which destroyed his credibility about being neutral about science or being an actually a good science journalist. So he has come back with this lab leak hypothesis and well, he's come back into a fair amount of credibility because people are not talking about what he had done earlier, which is very similar. People are treating him as a science correspondent, science journalist and how good his science could be. And that of course covers up for the uh, fact that he's now become the standard torchbearer of the anti-China and anti-Wuhan lab uh, case. Right. And finally, Prabhu, can you tell us, you know, how does even one does even, you know, go about evaluating this? I mean, there must be some sort of way to evaluate, uh, say, the existence of biological weapons. I mean, Saddam Hussein, for example, did open up the, uh, did, did give access for, for the search to be conducted for any possible existence of weapons. But so is there, even if that didn't help him, but uh, is there no such possibility here of any sort of evaluation being done to, to, to find out that if such a thing could have happened? You know, the, what you're asking is, do we have protocols for the research laboratories which deal with the biological uh, research of this kind? Whether there should be, there are protocols to see that these, there are transparency, there is transparency and there is sharing of information what kind of research that is being done. This was something the Biological Weapons Convention had proposed. This is something which is discussed. The Chemical Weapons Convention had also proposed uh, inspections, transparency, all of these. While in the chemical weapons, there was opposition from the United States as well as the uh, essentially by the chemical manufacturing companies that their intellectual property could be in public domain as a consequence, and they could be easily monitored, found out, and copied. But finally, the US agreed to the, the Chemical Weapons Treaty for this transparency and the protocols to be followed, inspections included. But in the case of biological weapons in 2001, they withdrew from the agreement. They said, we will not allow inspections. We will not allow any transparency or what we are doing in our research laboratories, biological uh, research laboratories. We're not going to call them weapons research laboratories, but biological research laboratories. Now, why did the withdraw is a separate question which we can discuss another time. But what is important to note, it happened in the Bush administration and John Bolton, who has been the key figure in withdrawal of United States from various weapons treaties. He was a key person here too, who said that the US should not do this and withdrew from the treaty. Now that had actually proposals of transparency and 
inspections, maintaining certain information. If all of that had been done, the Wuhan issue would have been over because all the issues they're raising, they would have been following a common protocol, which would have been common to all research laboratories of similar kinds. Here, it's an interesting issue. The United States is not saying that we should go back to the Biological Weapons Convention and relook at all of these for preventing such either things happening or from knowing about it in the future. They are saying, we just want to see subject Wuhan's lab to a complete exercise of finding that they, this did not happen in Wuhan lab, which means they're going to start finding the, in, you know, the name that they have Wuhan lab has to prove the opposite of what we are talking about. Not that it happened, but prove it didn't happen. So that's, of course, the negative argument. But the interesting part is that the United States, even today, it's not just Bush administration, even under the Obama administration, did not go back to this. Now, it's an interesting question why the United States refused or refuses even today to go back to the Biological Weapons Convention and say, in light of all these problems we now have, we should really have a, you know, a protocol to see that we know what each other is doing. The United States claimed that we're withdrawing from it because it's not verified, that if there's a weapon, we can't verify it. But the purpose of this was never about verifiability, it was about transparency. And the protocol did not go into the verifiability that you don't have new biological weapons, but the processes in the lab should be transparent. And that is something that they could have easily agreed upon, which they did in the chemical weapons case, but they did not do it in the case of biological weapons. Now, why they did not do so, the various issues. But let's also face facts that after the Second World War, the Japanese group which practiced biological weapons use and biological weapons research on a number of prisoners, including American prisoners, they were given total indemnity from uh, war crimes. And then based on the fact that they turned over all the research to the United States. There was a war crimes tribunal in Korea and where there was an international body which actually looked into the issue and said what Japanese research had happened. That was used by the United States against North Korea at that point of time in, that, in the Korean War. There, there are known examples of what they had done. So the US not giving access this, this issue about their uh, getting all the information from the Japanese uh, war criminals who had practiced biological weapons on in prisoners of war, including, as I said, American prisoners of war, is not public domain. It's not secret anymore. It has come in public domain. It's been released as a part of what the archives release regularly. So this is the reason that why the United States may we in public taking a position against biological weapons, we still may be conducting some dual use research. Now, here is the issue. We know that, bi that the biological uh, research of certain kinds are dual use. We know that vaccines, preparing vaccines, antibiotic in the bioreactors can also be used to create biological weapons. We are aware of, aware of that. So why is the UI US not willing to go back to the Biological Weapons Convention if it believes that there is this possibility of weapons research taking place in other countries is still an open question. And I really have no answer, except maybe that they either are conducting research which they don't want the world, world to know, or their biological companies think that they need to be very secretive about what they're doing and therefore intellectual property being what it is. It is the dividing line between having a market, controlling the market, or having competition. They're unwilling to share this uh, knowledge. The consequence is that the world then always will wonder, whenever there is a new pandemic, the world will always have this question. And the US having raised it once, will also face similar questions if a pandemic breaks out now in the United States, that people will say it happened because of your research that you are carrying out there. Already four day trick has been under scanner for some of these issues. So this unfortunately goes only into creating more and more conspiracy theories. 
And unfortunately, now we see the United States joining full, uh, full throatedly into a, a conspiracy theory, which early was restricted to a very fringe groups, but to very fringe groups in the world. Right. Right. So thank you, Prabhu, for joining us today for this discussion. And that's all the time we have. Keep watching this clip.